Hey guys, this is Shane here from Echo Soundworks. In this video, I'm gonna show you five simple steps you can use to choose the perfect kick for your track every time. All right, so dialing in that perfect kick sound is really difficult, especially if you're a beginner producer or in, you're an intermediate, or maybe you're trying out a new genre. So this is probably something I get asked all the time is how to improve the kick, right? Well. I decided to make five simple steps that you guys can follow, and this will help regardless of the genre you're making. So if you're making hip hop, if you're making a feature-based trap, any genre, subgenre of EDM, even pop, these five steps should help you get a good kick every time. So let's just get started. All right, so step number one, make sure you're using a high quality sample. Now I know you guys are probably rolling your eyes at this point because you know every Instagram influencer, YouTuber who sells samples or makes YouTube videos talks about using high quality samples and presets. Well, I'm actually gonna dive into a DAW right now and show you the difference between a poor quality kick sample and a high quality kick sample. And these things we're gonna check out generally hold true regardless of the genre of the kick sample. So let's take a look. All right, so I went through my sample collection and I found some bad kick samples. It was very weird <laughs> trying to find a bad kick, but these are all things that you're gonna want to avoid when you're searching through kick samples. Now, some of these things, especially if you're just starting out, are gonna be difficult to hear. And if that's the case, just drag them into your DAW, look at the audio waveform or pull up an EQ or a spectrum analyzer and it should become really clear. All right, first thing, try not to work with samples that don't have the key, the pitch, the root note of this kick in the name because then you have to go and find it. Now, this isn't a deal breaker, but all these kick samples I pulled in, they don't have you know, the actual tonic of the kick in there. And that's one of the tips later in the video is making sure you understand the importance of knowing the root key of your track and how that works with your kick. So for instance, if I wanted to find the uh, root of this sample, I'd have to pull up a spectrum analyzer and figure it out. Most kick samples that are worth, you know, worth the money, the people who create the samples, they put that information in there. Now, that's not a deal breaker. For instance, uh, Decap, who makes some great hip hop samples, he doesn't do that, but I'll, I'll still use his samples, right? So with Echo Soundworks, we actually do that with all of our kicks and snares just to make things a little bit easier for you guys. All right, second thing, true peak clipping. Now, true peak clipping is where you won't see clipping occurring on your actual channel, channel but if you pull up a meter that offers true peak metering or you start to mix and tweak that sample or that track with like an EQ or compressor, it'll just start clipping. And you'll be like, why is this kick clipping? It shouldn't be clipping. If that's ever happened to you, you're probably working with a sample that is true peak clipping. So here's a kick that true peak clips. So if we look at my meter, it looks like it's not clipping. If we look at the waveform, it's a little suspect. It's very, very, very high in amplitude at the top. And basically this occurs when the person who created the sample squashes the hell out of the sample with a compressor or a limiter. Now, here's what will happen. Let's say you pull up an EQ in your DAW and you're like, okay, I want to carve out a little bit of, oh, just a little bit of frequencies. You're not boosting frequencies, you're reducing. So you actually should be getting gain reduction with the kick. Check this out. Kick is still not clipping. Let's say I want to reduce 200 to 500, right? Because maybe you know, my bass is sitting there. I'm actually dragging this down by about you know three, four decibels. I should be losing volume, but now I'm going to clip. See that? So that, that's usually indicative of true peak clipping, and you could just pull up a multimeter and check or a metering plugin that has true peak limiting, or true peak metering, you can see up here where it says TP. Uh, we'll see we're in the red. By 1.5 decibels. Now, the reason why this is potentially bad, it's not always bad, sometimes it works, especially for hip hop, it's that when you start to mix the kick, if you have to do anything like EQ or compression, you might be kind of banging your head against the wall, being like, why is this clipping? I'm not doing anything adding volume, I'm trying to reduce volume, and it's clipping, and if you're a beginner, that can be really frustrating, it's because of the true peak clipping. Now it's also just gonna be harder to work with when you start mixing your track, when you start to add saturation or limiting or any, any type of you know mastering process, you're gonna have a headroom struggle with a kick that clips true peak. All right, next thing, DC offset. If you guys are CRM users, you might know about DC offset if you've ever messed around with the wavetable editor. So DC offset is a pretty uh, boring concept, but it's a pretty important one for sampling and something that I'm aware of when we create samples. Basically, if you're recording, it can happen when you're recording samples with bad quality recording or bad mic setup, but basically what happens is the uh, initial part of the audio waveform does not cross at a zero crossing. It's actually off of it. And if we zoom in on this kick, we can see that right here, this part of the waveform is up off of this horizontal line. If it was if it was occurring at the uh, zero crossing at the horizontal line, it would start right there. And this actually usually is indicative of two problems. 
kind of a phasiness with the left and right channel of a stereo kick, as well as not being able to get a lot of punch from that kick because your headroom is affected when you have DC offset occurring. So let's play the sample. Right, it's kind of a weird sounding kick in and of itself. But if we look at the left and the right channel, we can see that they, there's a difference between them, right? And this becomes an issue on the low, low end of a kick. So like, you don't really want phasiness occurring or you know a difference in, in the left and right channels on stereo tracks in the low end of your mix. That's why a lot of people just kind of say F it and make <laughs> kicks mono, right? Because then you don't have this. But that's part of this DC offset issue is that as it's starting, they're start, it's starting at different places and it just kind of creates a phasey sound as well as reduces the amount of punch you can get in the sample. So conversely, let's go back to the true clipping sample. Even though that one was true clipping, it does cross at a, uh, I, I believe it actually didn't cross at a zero crossing. Oh no, it does. Yeah, you can see here that this line, right when the audio starts, it's right at that horizontal line. So even though it's true clip, uh, peaking or it's peaking on a true clip meter, it at least crosses as zero crossing, right? So th that's the second thing. Third thing, late peaks. This just makes it harder to compress the kick and mix your tracks. So a kick should generally, if we see the shape of our true peak clipping kick, it has the proper shape for a kick. It has obviously a lot of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of volume at the beginning, it sustains, and then it tails down. Look at this kick right here. A lot of volume tails down, more volume tails down, and then this weird kind of like bulbous bulge at the end. It's a very weird looking kick sample. So if we play this, we'll actually hear this like boom uh, as it ends. Check this out. Right? And that makes it really hard to compress this kick. It's like, how do you set the attack and the release? Do you, you know, if you want to, <laughs> it, it would just be a nightmare. So what this should look like, if I actually like remake the sample here, I'll bounce this in place real quick. Right, that would be a more of a of a typical kick, right? And it doesn't have that big bulb at the end or that those those late peaks. All right, the next thing you want to be aware of is you want to make sure that the kicks aren't poorly layered. And I find this all the time with sample packs. And this is something that I'm very wary of when we're creating samples with Echo Sours. I don't want to layer sounds just to layer sounds just to make a new sound, right? And that's what a lot of people do. A lot of the, a lot of the beat makers out there who are making drum kits now, they're basically just layering a couple kicks together to call it a new sample. And sometimes that works and it works really well. And other times you get a kick that has like four different tunes or four different tunings, right? And I already mentioned previously in this section of the video, you want to work with a kick that has a tune to it. You, you know what the tonic is. We also don't want to work with a kick that has multiple you know, frequencies that could basically confuse you as to what the actual root note of that kick is. So if we look at this one with a frequency analyzer on it, we can see here that it, the lowest frequency looks to be about G-sharp 1. Then we're peaking at C-sharp up here. This is C4. A4, so there's a lot of frequency going on here, and uh, this would make it just difficult to work with. You can actually hear it too. You can hear the uh, the different tune there. So next thing, making sure that you're working with a kick that doesn't have too much transient or too little transient. The transient is a section right at the beginning of the kick, and we can see that it usually doesn't look like a sine waveform. So if we look at these kicks here, we can generally see a sine waveform. And then we see this kind of close together, squished together audio. That's the transient. That's the high frequency content in the kick that lets that first part of the kick punch and snap through the mix. Now, certain genres require less transients than others. But for instance, this kick right here would be a bad one for hip hop and future bass and certain genres of trap. But it might be great for kind of a tech house, deep house, some type of house music. So that, that we're going to cover those concepts a bit later in the video, but that's something to be aware of. Try not to work with samples that have too much transient too little transient, or too much body, too much low end, or too little. You kind of got to find one that's fairly balanced. All right, so now that we've looked at bad kicks, let's look at some good kicks so you can understand, you know, kind of reinforce those ideas. All right, so here is a kick that um, looks like it might be true peaking, right? And this is one of our kicks. And this is kind of in response to that first kick. So we can see that it is pretty hard, it's compressed pretty hard, right? These are basically square waves. And so it's gonna be a big kind of in-your-face kick. Right, now if we load up my multimeter, when we set this to true peak, right, I'm peaking at negative 0.5, so it is not clipping. Now another thing to, to look at here, 
there is no DC offset. The start is right at a zero crossing, right? So that's going to add to the perceived punch of the kick. We don't have late peaks as well. It tails out, right? And we have a transient and a body. So that's a good kick. Um, if we go down to the next one, here's another one of our kicks, different genre. Total different type of kick. Again, if we look at the zero crossing, right? Again, it's right on a zero crossing. Um, we can also see that there are no late peaks. It tails out. Now, check this out. This is a very stere a fairly stereo uh, kick. And in that, I can hear that it's layered. We layered it with some high-frequency content. And if I play this and we look at our frequency spectrum here, you'll see that the low end, there are two, there's supposed to be two lines there. They're right on top of each other. From 100 hertz down, there is no separation between the left and right channel. That's really important. And that's what makes this kick so damn punchy. Remember when I showed you this kick up here? Uh, let me unsolo that there. When I showed you a kick up here that did not have that, the DC offset one, if you remember this, see the low end is not, you know, it's not in phase, it's not lining up. And that reduces punch. So it's not that big of an issue though if the top end of your kick has some separation because that's just kind of ear candy for the kick. Right? All right, and then let's look at another one of our, our kicks here. This is more of a hip hop kick. Right, it has a good amount of sub to it. And again, if we look at this, we'll see all the things we previously talked about. Zero crossing, it's not clipping, there's no late body transients. And if we pull up our EQ, left and right channels are perfectly aligned, so it's gonna be punchy, right? And we have the tune in the kick, easy peasy. Now here's a decap kick, and I mentioned him a little bit earlier in the video. Love his samples, uh, makes some really good stuff, but uh, he doesn't put the pitch in his samples, I wish he would, but again, look, DC offset. It's not true peak clipping, you know, it doesn't have any of those issues we talked about. And this is a unique sounding kick, and if we look at it, Right, the low end is all lining up in terms of left and right channel. All right, so on to step two in the process. And this one you don't always have to do, but if you're a beginner or you're just starting out with a genre, I strongly suggest you do this a few times. And that's choosing a sample or a kick sample that sounds like the genre or subgenre you're creating the music for. Sounds like a no brainer, but you'd be surprised. So if you're making a house track, try to find some type of house oriented drum. If you're making a hip hop track, like a lo-fi or old school hip hop, try to find like a boom bap drum, right? And you don't always have to do this. Obviously, once you get to a certain level in your in your production ability and you've made a couple tracks in a certain genre, you've you develop the skill and the taste to be able to deviate off of the center line from what's expected in terms of sonic, you know, aesthetic, right? So at that point, you can get creative and maybe find a different type of kick sample because the rest of the sound sounds like the genre you're making and that can kind of become like the calling card take for instance elenium a couple years ago when he started getting more popular he swapped out the typical kind of trap style or edm trap style kick with more of an acoustic leaning kick and that became something that was synonymous with his sound right but Everything else in the genre was pretty straightforward in terms of future bass. So you can for sure get creative with it, but I would suggest though, if you're just starting out with a genre, to try to find the sound that fits that genre. All right, so to highlight the importance of working with samples, especially when you're starting out, that make sense in the context or the given context of the genre you're working in, let's listen to this hip hop track right now. And we'll listen to it without a kick. All right, so what I did was I pulled in one of our house kicks, right? Uh, it's from our, uh, it's from one of our sample packs, and it sounds like this in isolation. Now let's play it with this track. Right, it doesn't sound terrible, but it just doesn't sound right. Now there there probably is a kick in this folder that would actually fit this track a little bit better, even though it, these kicks were designed for house music. But let's take a listen to it now inversely with the drum that was actually created for this loop. Right? It already sounds like it fits a lot better and I don't have to do any mixing to it. It was a hip hop sample that we created from the ground up. 
All right, so on to step three in the process. And this one is probably one that most of you will know already. And that is to make sure you're working with kicks that are in key with your track. So for those of you who don't know really quick, let's say you're working on a song that's in the key of C major. There are no sharps or flats in C major, right? And let's say you find a kick sample that's you know F sharp. That's going to be clashing always with the low end of your mix. And it makes it hard for that kick to actually stand out in the mix and be present because there's just this weird thing going on with the frequencies in the kick and the low end. All right, now we're on to steps four and five. These are kind of tied together. That's why they're gonna be in the same section. So we're actually gonna talk about choosing the sample, right? I've done a whole video up until this point about choosing a kick drum and I actually haven't told you how to choose it. These are kind of the pre-steps like kind of preheating the oven up until this point. So how do you choose the sample? Well, obviously go through steps one through three. Now, once you've done that, here's what, here's what I think works the best. First ask yourself and think, well, do I already have an established low end in my track? Do I already have a baseline? Do I already have a sub that I like or an 808? Maybe you're working on a hip hop track and you found an 808 or you know you just have some type of low end presence in your mix and you're trying to like find that perfect kick. Well, if you answer yes to I already have a low end presence, it's pretty simple. You need to find a kick that's going to easily fit into the mix that you've already created, right? So if there's already a lot of low end in the sub range, you're not gonna want a sub heavy kick. You're gonna wanna try to find a kick that has, you know, less of the subs and maybe more of a transient or a tick so it pops out in that mix. Now let's say the inverse is true. Let's say you don't have any low end established. Well, now you can basically choose any kick that you want. Make sure that it follows steps one through three that we previously outlined. And then you can basically at that point, you have to shape the low end of your mix to fit the kick. So you can do it both ways. A lot of people will say, you know, you can only do it one way, which is shape everything and kind of mold everything around the kick. You don't have to. It really depends on your creative process. Some people start with bass and chord progressions. Some people start with drums. It's up to you, but that's how you can do it. So let's actually look at a track and I'm going to basically show you one of those options and we're going to try to find the perfect kick for the track. All right, so here's the track that I need to add a kick to. Now, I already have a couple instruments in. I have a guitar, a warped guitar, a Reese bass, and some ambient vocals. So there already is some established vibe and some frequency ranges that I need to take into consideration when choosing the kick. All right, so I'm gonna go to a Future Bass sample pack, one of ours, uh, it's from our pack, the Synergy Future Bass Drums, and it's uh, gonna be a good starting point. And I could use different, probably genre of samples for this, but let's just start there and see what we have. Now, I'm gonna be going through the checklist of you know what makes a good kick as I find this sample. So first things first, tonic, the key, the song is in F sharp major. So I want to find possibly, hopefully a snare or, or kick sample that's at F sharp naturally, or maybe within one semitone either way up or down. So I can see here I have a bunch of F samples. We have a couple F sharps and G. So there's probably about 14 samples or 13 samples um, that are within one semitone. So that's a great starting point. So let's listen to a couple of the F sharps. That one might work. That one probably doesn't have enough snap to it, a little bit lower. Let's go to one of the Gs. Let's try 28. All right, I like that one. I, I don't want one that has a lot of a tail for this section. I want kind of a shorter one. So let's actually try that. I'm going to drag that in, and then we'll start to go through uh, more parts of our checklist. So there it is. Let's let's uh, turn that off for now. So, all right, so if I zoom in here to look for DC offset, that was one of the first things we talked about. Um, we don't. We're not going to see any. It's an echo sound example. So we always we typically check for those. Yeah, it looks looks good. Uh, it doesn't seem to be any true peak limiting. I'll pull up my multimeter to double check. All right, so we're not clipping. We won't have true peak clipping occurring. Uh, we also can see that there's no late peaks. You got that nice kick shape. And I already know the tonic. It's in the name of the sample. So let's go and transpose this. So I'm going to make sure this is set to rhythmic and transpose down just one semitone to get to F sharp. So now let's just copy and paste this out. All right, so I've laid out the uh, pattern here. Let's take a quick listen. All right, so that kick sounds pretty good as is. Again, that's because we're trying, you know, we're trying to fit it to the track, but let's just mix it a little bit. Now, I'm going to take out some of the low frequency again because I'm trying to match it to what I have here, and I have that re-space taking up about 50 to 100 hertz quite prominently in this section of the track. I also want to roll off some of the highs. And I'm also going to pull up a transient shaper and turn the sustain down. And 
And then, of course, I'd set my levels. But you guys get the idea. That's a pretty good sounding kick with this uh, drum pattern that we already had. All right, guys, that's going to sum up the video. If you have any questions or comments, post those, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. If you guys aren't subscribed to our channel, please do that. We're super close to 20K. We would love to get to 20,000 subscribers by the end of the year, so the support would mean a lot. And if you do, if you do subscribe, smash that notification bell so you get an update when we release a new video. All right, thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.